The Drink Dr. Pepper Good for Life Rick logo is the one that was in style when I came on the scene back in 1947. Since the theme of this year's convention is uncanny catchphrases, I decided to create my own canny, uncanny catchphrase and use it for the title of my portion of the seminar. It's called Dr. Pepper Good for My Life. <clears throat> in 1936, my dad, J.T. Jake Bryant, and a friend set out on a two-day, 400-mile journey from Ponder, Texas to Clovis, New Mexico on a business venture in hopes of establishing a Help Yourself laundromat. In their minds, this was to be the first of many. I was never told of all the details, but I do know that once they arrived, they learned the facility where the laundromat was going to be set up was not ready and wouldn't be for a while. They decided to wait it out. After getting a nice place to stay, Dad went to a nearby store to pick up some supplies. While there, he asked the cashier if he knew of any jobs available around town. The man standing next in line said he might try the Doc Pepper buying plant over on West 7th. His son worked there but was homesick and wouldn't be going back. Dad said he would drop by on his way back home and apply. That's when the man told him not to do that but just show up at 4 a.m. in the morning and be ready to work. Who would have ever thought that the next morning would be the beginning of a 31-year adventure that would define my dad, my mom, and our family for the rest of our lives? I don't want to make this like a home movie or a picture show, so what I plan to do is give a brief timeline of the 31 years and then highlight certain things along the way with a few then and nows. I hope you find it interesting and informative and maybe, just maybe, you'll hear something you didn't know. Here's the timeline. 1936, my dad started to work for the Doc Pepper Bottling Company in Clovis, New Mexico. In 1937, Mom and Dad got married in Durant, Oklahoma. In 1939, my oldest sister Beverly was born in Clovis. 1941, the Clovis plant was traded for the Doc Pepper plant in Clayton, New Mexico, and within a month it was moved to Dalhart, Texas, and this was the same year when Dad became part owner by purchasing 25% of the business. In 1944, Dad was inducted into the United States Army. In 1945, my middle sister Karen Ann was born in Denton, Texas. Dad was honorably discharged from the Army and the bottling plant was moved to East 3rd Street, from East 3rd Street to 401 Rock Island. 1947, Dad was blessed with two boys in the month of November. In 48, Dad took ownership of 49% of the business and then in 1954, he, re he purchased the remaining 51% and became sole owner of the Dr. Pepper Bottling Company in Dalhart, Texas. 1967, on November 30th, he sold his plant to the Dalhart Coca-Cola Bottling Company, which was owned by the Cockwood family, who had just built a brand new facility. That's the timeline, and now for the details. 1930s, not exactly sure when this photo was taken, but it was somewhere between 1936 and 1941. Luther Faust, Faust, second from the left with the Panama hat, was the owner, along with his brother Johnny Faust, who also owned a plant who also owned a plant in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and one in El Centro, California. My dad is third to the right of Mr. Faust, and the only other gentleman I know in the photo is their super salesman, Daryl White, second from the far right. Here's a picture of Mr. Faust on the left with one of his route salesmen. Notice the truck on the left, excuse me, notice the truck on the right and the pickup on the left look almost identical. Here's a then and now comparison of the Clovis plant back in the 1930s and a more recent photo from 2013. A Facebook friend of mine sent me this recent photo of the building at 512 West 7th, which is now an auto mechanic shop called Clovis Safety Lane. Here's an envelope that was mailed to my mom from Clovis, New Mexico, which contained the local newspaper article pertaining to her, her marriage to my dad. It was postmarked on the same day of their wedding, Wednesday, November 24th, 1937. The article, this is the article that was taped to the, an original sheet of Clovis Dr. Pepper letterhead. My oldest sister Beverly was born in Clovis, and here's our homecoming. Apparently, Dad was getting to drive the company pickup to and from work. Dad and his good friend Daryl White. Dad and Luther conversing next to their Miller Hydro bottle washer and Dixie bottling machine. Here's that same bottling machine as it would look if it were in action. 
Mr. Faust's two daughters sitting on a Doc Pepper panel truck that was used for painting and hanging Doc Pepper signs all around the Clovis area. If you notice all the Doc Pepper vehicles appear dark in these pictures, that's because they were all painted red. Here's an old Clovis Doc Pepper bottle I found on eBay which I bought and gave to my sister for her birthday. Now we get to the 1940s. In 1941, Mr. Faust traded the Clovis plant for the one in Clayton, New Mexico, and within a month, he moved it to East 3rd Street in Dalhart, Texas, so it would be more centrally located in their franchise area. According to my sister, this building also had a one-room apartment within its walls and is where she and our parents lived for a short period before moving to a little duplex. Here's a map I made showing their six-county franchise area. It includes Cimarron County in the Oklahoma Panhandle, Union County in northeastern New Mexico, and Dallum, Harley, Sherman, and Moore counties in the northwestern part of the Texas Panhandle. Dad, Beverly, Mr. Faust, and Darrell as Darrell was fixing to head out early one morning. I counted 92 cases on the top of his truck. Check out how the bigger bottles are all staggered to keep most of the other cases from falling off. Dad and Beverly noticed the Dr. Pepper patch next to Dad's right pants pocket. I'm still wondering if that was in the manual. Here's Darrell with a lighter load on a cold winter's day, judging by the slush on the ground. And here's a couple of delivery trucks there in Dalhart. Here's a couple of pictures on either side of Beverly uh, in front of the old plant when she was three or four years old with Pretty Peggy Pepper. The one in the middle was when she was a little older and was taken when we attended our first club, collector's club convention back in 2008. Here's the then and now picture of the plant on East 3rd Street in 1941 and again in 2013. On a side note, in early 1997, Dad, Mom, Beverly and I went back to Dalhart so Dad could get his car inspected. We drove by this building and it still had an old Doc Pepper door push attached to one of those double doors. We made a family decision that was probably ours and somehow it wound up in my collection. It's not in the best of shape, but from looking at where it came from and its age, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm so glad that I got that second photo on the door push because in 2015 the building was totally demolished. In 1944, Dad was inducted into the United States Army. He had his basic training at Fort Custer in Battle Creek, Michigan, and upon completion of basic, he was declared too old, 35 years of old, 35 years of age, for overseas duty. So he spent the rest of his military career in Fort Lewis, Washington, as a guard of prisoners of war. Here's an old inventory sheet from 1944. The one that thing that caught my eye was the Carol syrup. The war was going on, and I know sugar was being rationed. But I learned from this that carol syrup could be used as a sweetener for soft drinks and was also a substitute for sugar. In August 1945, my middle sister Carol Ann was born in Denton, Texas. In 1946, Dad was honorably discharged from the military and returned to the Doctor of Buying plant in Dalhart. Just in time to help move the plant from East 3rd Street over to 401 Rock Island and a new neon Doc Pepper sign was proudly displayed on the corner of that building. Here comes the trucks and they are in color. There are only two trucks and one pickup, but all of the pictures are different, I promise. The paint scheme is Doc Pepper green with yellow wheels and a porcelain triangular Doc Pepper door signs. The two trucks are 1940-ish Rios and the pickup was a 1941 Chevrolet. Notice the truck with the homemade doors in the background. It was the out-of-town truck and, was in, and the enclosures were helped to prevent all the bottles from freezing and, and bursting on cold winter days like the one in the picture. It helped somewhat, but there were still a lot of casualties. What was really cool about this was that when that truck came back in in the evening, you had your choice of frozen flavored pop. And I believe most of these pictures were probably taken on a Saturday or Sunday because there's not much traffic and uh, activity going on. And you can also tell that the trucks were staged because all the drinks are only on one side of the truck. Pretty cool though. And here's the then, then and now of the planet 401 Rock Island. In 1947 at the top, 1985 in the center, and in August 2016 at the bottom. It's still standing, but probably not for long, and it's pretty cluttered inside. The old 1941 Chevrolet pickup lasted until about 1965. It got to where it wouldn't stay in third gear, and the driver's side door wouldn't stay shut. You had to drive with one hand on the door, the other hand holding it in gear and steering with your thigh. 
Dad sold it to a high school friend of mine, Kurt Presley, for $25. Can you imagine that? November 1947, Mr. Faust attended the annual Doc Pepper Bottlers Convention in Dallas, and I believe he is seated. This is Mr. Faust here, and this is Mrs. Grace Prim Lyons from the Dublin Doc Pepper Bottling Company, the oldest Doc Pepper Bottling Company in the world. I mentioned in my timeline at the beginning that in November my dad was blessed with two boys. Well, the first one was named Perky. He was awarded to my dad's partner in Dallas. Later in the month, he was awarded to my dad and the rest of the crew, the rest of the pers plant personnel. I had, the I had had this original photo for a long time but never knew it was featured in the December 1947 clock dial until going to, through the museum's archives back in the late 90s and found it. I made a copy of that page and later Jessica Harris from the museum made a photocopy of the entire magazine for me. It was a wonderful keepsake, but I longed for and kept looking for the original clock dial. Then, the latter part of March 2014, I got a package in the mail from my good friend and fellow Dr. Pepper collector, Bryce Gardner. And guess what I found upon opening it? A mint, December 1947 clock dial, and I felt like my collection was complete. This to me is what collecting is all about, and Bryce is the prime example. Thank you, buddy. Here's a picture and, and the, of the article in that clock dial. Clarence McNabb, Luther Faust, Jack Cates, Alvy Wright, Dad, and Mr. Thompson from the parent company. Here's a then and now of that same office scene in 1947 and again in 2016, almost 70 years apart. And this is a picture I took from inside the old plant facing the office. I have superimposed a selective N48 or just where one used to be. Originally, the dark green door covering the coin mechanism was removed and you could hold, your, hold a little lever down and push down on the crank and a six and a half ounce frosty cold hot pepper would be dispensed for free. Everyone in town who came through that front door knew how to work this machine. They would drink a Doc pepper or two, visit, watch this bottle or sort bottles and sometimes even bought a case to take home. It was kind of like Mayberry, only this time it was in Dalhart. Here's the second boy that came along in November. That is me, my mom, and our Dr. Pepper radio, cooler radio. When I got a little older, that radio, which I don't have anymore, was an item that I tried to update from the 40s to the 60s and failed. New paint and decals just didn't seem to work. This is me cutting my teeth on a, a Dr. Pepper bottle around eight or nine months old along with my sister, Carol Ann. My maternal grandparents wanted their picture with a Dr. Pepper cooler radio. This is Clarence McNabb, our route supervisor in early 1948, in a picture I received from his niece, Carolyn McNabb, who was a classmate of mine. I have several pictures of this wreck truck, but never knew the details of what actually happened. My own hometown newspaper, the Dalhart Texan, digitized and archived all of their old papers, and I was able to find and retrieve the story. It happened on Thursday, February 19, 1948, on a road outside of Dumas, Texas. Mr. McNabb dozed off at the wheel, when he awoke, he realized he was in the wrong lane, overcorrected, nearing the covert, overcorrected, went off the road, and overturned twice. He was not injured, as you can see from the picture, but the truck was totaled. On a side note, just a bit of Texas history. Is anyone familiar with Foxworth Galbraith Lumber Company? Well, Dalhart was founded in 1901 at a railroad junction in the Texas Panhandle, and Foxworth Galbraith established itself at the same time and place in order to take advantage of the railroad construction. That's the original Foxworth Galbraith Lumberyard in the background, and it was right across the street from the Dalhart Dr. Pepper Bottling Company. The 1949 crew left to right, Jack Clifton, route salesman, Alvy Wright, route salesman, Clarence McNabb, route supervisor, and Tucker Jack Cates, plant manager and bottler. This is a sheet of Dalhart Dr. Pepper letterhead that I've recreated and used for my personal correspondence. The reason I noted this is because of this. This little logo at the bottom. Notice this Dr. Pepper route salesman is carrying two cases of Dr. Pepper, one in each hand, and he does it by holding on to the bottle, a bottle in each case, and has his thumb in the, in the case handle. I actually weighed a case of re full, regular Dr. Peppers, and it weighed a little over 36 pounds. Carrying two cases like this is quite a feat. I have heard these men call truck drivers, delivery guys, and things like that, and they were, but they were much, much more. They were goodwill, frontline ambassadors, advertisers, and salesmen, just to name a few. It wasn't an 8 to 5 Monday through Friday job, it was a before sunup until after sundown job and many times 
more than five days a week for a base salary plus commission. It wasn't an easy job. Here's a photo of our local, from our local newspaper back in the mid-1940s of an event called the XIT Rodeo and Reunion held annually in Dalhart the first Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of August. It's a Western affair, and if you were caught not wearing something Western, you were tossed into a horse tank full of water. Notice the Doc Pepper sign in the background, painted on the side of Jack's Cafe. It was a hand-painted sign my dad painted using a pounce pattern, which is a paper overlay with tiny pinholes outlining the lettering and design of the sign. You hold it in place and then pat on charcoal powder, and it leaves the pattern on the surface with which you wish to paint. The 1950s. In the 1950s, I got the opportunity to attend a few Doc Pepper Bottlers conventions with my parents. Most of them were in Dallas at places like the Baker Hotel, the Adolphus, the Statler Hilton, and the Sheridan Dallas. The one not in Texas was in Memphis, Tennessee at the Peabody Hotel where they had these ducks and a water fountain in the lobby and it's a major event to watch them march in every morning from the roost on the roof and then march them back out in the evening. You should check it out on YouTube. This was one of my earlier conventions at the Baker Hotel when I had just turned 10 years old. Got my own badge, and you can see overnight lodging for three was only 11 bucks. With the theme of Frosty Man Frosty, I'm sure it involved Frosty Dog, like our own convention did just a few years back. You've probably all seen these postcards with a picture of the Doc Pepper Parent Company at 5523 Mockingbird Lane in Dallas. How many of you have ever been inside of it? Do you remember the smell? It smelled like Doc Pepper syrup, didn't it? Well, I've gotten the opportunity twice. The first time was late, back in the late 50s with my family when we were on vacation. And my dad really took this really nice picture of this beautiful building. Nice enough, I thought, to be framed. The next time, it was in 1981 when Cindy and I got married. We had our honeymoon at the, in Dallas at the Reunion Tower. And I had three places I wanted to visit. South Fork, the Wax Museum in Grand Prairie, and the Doc Pepper plant on Mockingbird Lane. Here's Cindy standing in front of a lot of Doc Pepper memorabilia that I bet is in one of or many of your collections. Here's me standing beside an old Dixie bottle machine similar to the one we had in Dalhart. This is my dad bottling Nesbitt Orange with his Dixie 7 bottle dial bottling machine. It bottled a case of 24 bottles a minute. The little tray behind him is where you would set cases of empty bottles and I stood on two or three empty cases to feed the soaker. Many times we would bottle all day from the time the trucks pulled out until they pulled back in. To give you some idea, to bottle a 55 gallon barrel of Doc Pepper syrup using six and a half ounce bottles, it would take a little over five hours, barring no problems, and would fill approximately 293 cases. The 10 ounce or king size bottles would take a little over four hours and fill approximately 196 cases. I could talk for a long time about the bottling process or some of the other things I got the opportunity to do, like mixing syrups, repairing, painting, and stenciling cases painting trucks and coolers, candling squirt, being a swamper on a delivery truck, running the plant for a month while dad was in the hospital, sorting bottles, loading unloading trucks by hand, or pulling them out all by myself, or just to, to name a few. All of this happened mainly because my elementary school was only two blocks away and within walking distance from the plant. I spent most of my early childhood all the way up through high school here. Even during the summer months, if I was being misbehaving at home, Mom would have Dad take me back to the plant after lunch for the rest of the day. And you thought having to stand in the corner was bad. Mom, Dad, and me and my favorite t-shirt, Frosty Dog. In the backyard on Peach with a couple of my Frosty Pups in a club, my clubhouse with a porcelain triangular Doc Pepper sign on the side. Always promoting Doc Pepper and wearing my Frosty Dog t-shirt with my two sisters, one of their friends, and my mom in our house over on Peach Avenue. The 1960s. In 1960, I got to attend another Doc Pepper bottle meeting with my parents in Dallas, and this was at the scheduled events. Sure looked similar to our schedule of itinerary with the same days of the week and a lot of the activities. Our club is definitely a chip off the old block. It was held in the Sheridan Dallas Hotel, which was right next to the South and Life building, which I believe at the time was the tallest building west of the Mississippi. $16.48 for one night for a party of three. The theme of this convention was basics, the key to success. Keys for a daily treasure chest were given to all attendees and our take home was this gold Doc Pepper car key. They had blanks for whatever kind of car you had, a General Motors, Ford, American Motors, or a Chrysler. These companies were pretty basic too. 
Here's another doctor convention I got to attend at the Statter Hilton where Foots Clements used a million dollar prop for his presentation. It was a metal display case with about an inch thick glass front and it contained one hundred ten thousand dollar bills and I got an up close look of it when this officer lifted me up for a better look. I think our take home from this convention was a six and a half ounce Dr. Pepper bottle with a new dollar bill inside. Dad displayed this bottle right alongside of his candy stripe bottle from another convention in his office window until one day they were both gone. This is Floyd Doc Tiefeteller, one of our route salesmen we had in the 1960s. I believe every Dr. Pepper plant in the country had their own route salesman named Doc. Notice the paint scheme of his truck, white over Dr. Pepper green with white wheels and the bouncy P logo with no chevron. And on a side note here, my good friend Victor Chandler from Dalhart used to be Ch uh, Doc's swamper. He'd pick him up and take him with him on his route during uh, whenever he was in Dalhart. One of Doc's paid uh, receipts in this route book was for a case of six and a half ounce Dr. Pepper charged two dollars and twenty cents less one dollar deposit, which was four cents per bottle and four cents for the case for the empties for a net total of one dollar and twenty cents. This calculates to be only a nickel a bottle. What a bargain! This is Troy Potter, the other route salesman who came to work for Dad right out of high school. He was only 17 or 18 years old and a ball of fire. He built more displays than I had ever seen. Here's just a few of the ones he built in the Pleasure Island contest when he was in Dumas. 29 cents a carton for king size. Here's an autographed souvenir I received from Dick Clark, an American bandstand DJ and Dr. Pepper salesman or spokesman in the 1960s. One of our local grocery stores in Delhart displayed what would, during the Win a Solid Gold Dinosaur contest when they were running two six packs of King Side Dr. Pepper for 79 cents. And here's my two sisters, Carol and Beverly, sampling Dr. Pepper at the same display. And if I remember right, they used seven ounce cups, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Pepper cups, so you got the whole bottle. Here's a letter Dad received, Dad received from the office of Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson in June 1962 regarding congressional action dealing with foreign and domestic sugar prices just 19 months before the Kennedy assassination and Johnson became president. Here's another XIT event I spoke about earlier. This was the free barbecue on Saturday. We sold six and a half ounce bottles of Dr. Pepper for 10 cents and Coke was selling their product for the same price but in premix. What that meant was they got to go home or the rodeo after the barbecue. We had to stay and pick up all the empty bottles. Don't miss those days one bit. Christmas time was always a special occasion and we seemed to always get something in the mail from Dallas. Here's a couple of Christmas cards we received from Foots Clements. And this was one we received from Westby and Doris Parker who was the president and chairman of the board uh, back in the 60s. And we also received this from the parent company. This was a 16 by 20 portrait of the plant on Mockingbird. A tradition my family had on Christmas Eve that I fondly remember was to put several cases of Dr. Pepper in the trunk of our car, drive around town, and set one on the front porch of each of our many close friends and neighbors. They would wake up to either a frosty cold or an ice cold case of Dr. Pepper depending on how low the temperatures dropped the night before. I got a response from a card I sent out just this past Christmas. It was from a lady whose family of 11 lived next door to us and she wrote how they always looked forward to finding that case of Dr. Pepper on their front porch on Christmas morning. Some of the smallest acts of kindness have the biggest and most lasting rewards. Everybody in my family drank Dr. Pepper, including my precious little Gidget. A picture from a high school class mixer my senior year where Dr. Pepper and Pomac were served and got posted in our annual. My dad's last achievement award from Doc Pepper Company, a sales training diploma certifying him as an accredited Doc Pepper sales trainer on March 3, 1967 and signed by Val Martin 50 years ago just this last March. Here's a lineup of all the beverages that we bottled over the period of 31 years that I can remember. Squirt, Delaware Punch, Suncrest flavors, 6.5 ounce Pomac, Doc Pepper regular and king size, 6.5 ounce dietetic Doc Pepper, 7 ounce Nesbitt orange and Faust flavors. We even sold pint bottles of Delaware Punch syrup if there was any syrup left over after we finished bottling the product. Dad got his picture in the Dalhart Daily Texan newspaper just one last time a couple of months before he sold the plant. A cool ending to a 31 year career with Doc Pepper and I firmly believe 
that my dad helped make Dr. Pepper America's most leading soft drink. Period. I found an article while doing my research as to why Dr. Pepper bottlers in the 1960s may have sold their business to Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola bottlers, including my dad. In 1963, a district court ruling enabled Dr. Pepper to expand when the United States District Court declared that Dr. Pepper was not, only, not a cola. The ruling allowed independent bottlers to carry Dr. Pepper along with Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola since bottlers could now carry Dr. Pepper without violating their franchise contracts which states that bottlers are not permitted to bottle competing brands. Through close personal contacts and cooperative promotional efforts, Dr. Pepper aggressively courted independent bottlers, including my dad. From 1968 to 1977, under the guidance of Chief Executive Officer Woodrow Wilson, Foots Clements, sales increased from 41.9 to $226.8 million. In the same period, net earnings jumped from 4.1 to $20.3 million. On November 30, 1967, Dad sold his Dr. Pepper bottling plant to the Dalhart Coca-Cola bottling company owned by the Cockwood family. They had just built a brand new facility and were only wanting to bottle Dr. Pepper, wanting the Dr. Pepper franchise and were only going to bottle king-size Dr. Pepper. Just an FYI, there may be a lot of good digging out at the old Dalhart dumping grounds where all of my dad's plant assets were probably taken after the purchase. The Cockwoods eventually sold out to the Coke plant in Amarillo and their old facility is now privately owned and used for storage. These Dr. Pepper aluminum or stainless steel back letters are still attached to that building as of August 2016 and could probably be purchased at the right price if anyone was interested. As my family tradition continues on into the 21st century, I met, first met Bill Closter at his and my first Dr. Pepper Collectors Convention back in 2008 a couple of guys who just happened to be sons of Dr. Pepper bottlers. Feeling like VIPs, very important peppers at the next to last Dublin Dr. Pepper birthday party in 2010 with our good friend Bill Closter. My son Jonathan Thomas Bryant, same initials as his grandfather, at nine months old back in 1983 with what he called pepper juice. Jonathan met Jeff Closter in San Antonio a few years back at a showing of bottled up. Just another couple of guys who happen to be grandsons of Dr. Pepper bottlers. And I'm still trying to drink my daily dose of Dr. Pepper at least one two liter a day. My good friend and high school classmate Don Cantrell click owns a magazine publishing company in Amarillo called Accent West. When I sent him a bottle of Dublin Dr. Pepper jelly about five years ago he put me on the cover of his magazine and even wrote a little article about me and the jelly. He called me the Dr. Pepper dude, and I've also been called Frosty, but I have never ever been called Doc. In closing, I'd like to show you my three grandchildren, Hazel Grace, John Paul, and Victoria Esther, all who happen to love Dr. Pepper just about as much, if maybe even more than I do. When they were younger, I tried to get them to call me Peppa, a combination of Dr. Pepper and Grandpa, but it was never meant to be. Peppa Pig won that one. Here's just a little sampling of my grandchildren. Hazel Grace, and this is John Paul. Hazel Grace cutting her teeth, and John Paul. Hazel Grace and John Paul. Hazel Grace and John Paul drinking it like I do. Hazel Grace and John Paul. Hazel Grace and John Paul still drinking like I do. So does she. John Paul cutting his teeth. Love the Dr. Pepper trucks. And this is Victoria. She loves Dr. Pepper too. That's my presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. God bless.